I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar series of the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC. Uh, today's presentation is entitled, Protecting Controlled Unclassified Information in Non-Federal Information Systems and Organizations. My name is Steve Warzala, and I'm the CSIAC Outreach Manager. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of administrative notes before we begin our presentation today. Uh, first, all your phones or microphones have been muted except for those of the presenters. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, you, you, you can do so at any time during the presentation by utilizing the uh, chat function. Um, and time permitting, uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll take your questions and, uh, and uh, try to get some answers for you. And uh, finally, I'd like to uh, take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, and that is the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC. Uh, the funding that DTIC provides enables uh, CSIAC to conduct these uh, webinars. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Mr. Wade Kastroff. Uh, Wade is employed by SRC, Inc. as a security systems engineer responsible for lifecycle enterprise scale information assurance for both government and commercial organizations. For over 15 years, he's been involved with the development of Enterprise Information Assurance Strategy, IA Assessment Planning and Execution, the transition of legacy systems to the current risk management framework, and the evaluation of proposed information systems impact to current and future enterprise information security baseline. Mr. Kastroff is a certified information system security professional and has also earned several SANS Institute certifications including advanced incident handling and advanced hacker techniques, and system forensics investigations and response. Uh, I will now turn the presentation over to Mr. Kasaroff. Uh, good afternoon, Wade. The uh, floor is yours. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. And hello to everyone. It's 12 noon here on the East Coast. A little after that, and I'd like to spend some time talking to you guys about the NIST document. The title's quite long, but the reality is that we need today to protect government information on our non-federal information systems. So our focus today is more on concerning ourselves with protecting that data along with our current uh, corporate uh, information. The, the real focus is going to be today focus at the initial impacts on contractors. So today what I'm going to try to provide you is some answers. What is the 800-171? From probably now on, you're going to hear me call it 171 for short. What is controlled and classified information? How do we go about implementing 171 requirements? And some references and links. What is NIST? 800-171, the special publication. Well, the government, for those of you who've been involved in, in the government for a long time, like a lot of us have been, this is uh, taking controlled unclassified information, which we know is for official use only or law enforcement sensitive, or my favorite one is unclassified no foreign information and protecting it in a standardized manner. It's been my experience being involved with both the DOD and intelligence communities that based upon the organization that you're in, uh, they come up with the, the how they're to protect the data. One organization that I've been involved in protects for official use only as if it's top secret information, wherein other organizations protect that information in a more friendly manner. What you're going to find is, is that 171 is tailored from 853 security controls. Please note, I'm going to use the word requirements a lot here because that's what they call them. They don't call them controls like we do in 53. You're also going to find that there's some uh, uh, some um, FIPS um, 200 requirements that pop into this, and the wording is for, directly from FIPS. So they've combined both FIPS requirements and 53 requirements. They've standardized, standardized upon some derived requirements from each of these documents. The, the standardization allows for organizations, non-federal organizations, meaning contractors like SRC, to be aware uh, to work from the same set of standards and, and with less interpretation than you have to do with 53. There's 14 security families out there that we'll work with. Each of those families align closely with 853, 
but they are not identical. Um, they're close, but not completely identical. And, as the government would like to say, it makes it easier. Well, with all that being said, we need to really think about 800-171 and what it means to us. How I discovered and learned was working with a colleague of mine within SRC is that we worked with the Defense Industrial Base with the Department of Defense and their CIO's office to come up with what they're looking for, what they mean the DOD is looking for from these requirements and how can we better define them for the contractor base, the defense contractor base that's available out there. While doing this, we discovered that there's different interpretations based upon quite often the size of the organization, meaning the contractor organization that's involved, on the level of effort they're going to go to protecting government data or the controlled unclassified information. Are we required to implement 800-171? If you're a DOD contractor, the answer to that question is very strongly yes. Why? The answer why is very simple. They've placed it in our contracts now using DFAR language that's been published not once but twice. What you're seeing there is the original uh, letter that came out from DOD on the 8th of uh, October implementing some very short burn uh, rate, uh, short time frames for implementing two pieces of 800-171 and some other requirements. One of those is incident response. You need to have, your organization needs to have an incident response program and methodology for reporting to DOD if, um, what, what I'll get into it a little deeper in a little bit, but controlled defense information has been compromised on your network. Number two is, is multi-factor authentication. Now, multi-factor authentication can be debated on what it is, on how it works, and all of that. And I'll get to that a little deeper uh, further into the conversation here today. But what we're, what we're seeing is, is the government uh, is, in my opinion, attempting to protect their data by using multi-factor authentication to try to slow down someone for having lateral movement or access by not having that, those two different authentication methods, albeit um, something you have with something you know. You know, this is down to the basics. And what we're talking about um, implementing is uh, some people are using um, the PIV type card or a, a, a token based system and some organizations already have them but this is this is something we've looked at in SRC quite extensively and have found what we think is going to be our satisfactory solution. What's very interesting about working with 171 and with the defense industrial base is that we found that they are not telling us what to do specifically. The requirements are there for the non-federal organization, which I'll get into this in just a minute, to make a decision on what they feel their risk tolerance is and how they'll explain that the risk to the DOD CIO. If, as an organization, we choose to not do auditing, just as an example, in, in a, at the level that we do auditing that satisfies our own organization or our own company's requirements, and we present that to DOD, DOD should accept our level of auditing based upon the way this communications is written in 171 and the follow-on documents. I find that as a security professional that's worked on the inside, on the federal side as a CETA uh, contractor, very difficult to get my hands wrapped around because quite traditionally in this, organ this type of situation, we're very directive in nature. And now we're getting very soft and... and, and uh, communicative and saying, hey, this is what we think is right. When we jump ahead, you'll find that that assessing this is going to be difficult. Does the 171 replace 853? No, it doesn't. It's very specifically why. And that is because 800-171 is written for non-federal organizations. What is a non Again, a non-federal organization is uh, and I'll get a little more detail here, is a contractor organization that is protecting government information. 853 is specifically written for federal information systems. Now, I would assume that there's a few of you out there probably wringing your hands right now or, or scratching your foreheads thinking, well, the SEC has said we'll use 853 requirements for protecting financial data. You'll find that the uh, critical infrastructure folks have used 853. Well, 
Let's not go too far off the reservation here. 171 has used 850 or derived 853 requirements. They are not specific quotes, and in fact, it gets a little hot when you talk to the folks about 853. But those requirements are very much parallel, and you'll find yourself referencing 853 because the 171 does reference that information in 853. Here's what I'm talking about. As a DOD contractor, quite often we're asked, or some organizations are asked to operate two types of information systems. And, and these are definitions based upon 4009, uh, CNSSI 4009, and based upon 853 and all kinds of the other NIST documents, those of you who are familiar with them. And what we're seeing here is, is that there's two types of information systems. There are federal information systems and non-federal information systems. This definition also comes into N171. What we're saying is, is a federal information system can be something that a organization, we're going to use SRC for example, um, has a government, government information technology system that they are maintaining a node on in their, in their facility. That is a federal information system. You are tasked by contract to ensure that that information system is compliant with federal rules. Now, a non-federal information system is really simple. If it's not federal, it's a non-federal system. It's almost too simple to understand at times for me, even myself, because it just seems too easy. But what we're talking about today is a contractor information system or SRCinc.com, for example, um, and how we're going to protect government data that is, resides on there. I'd like to move a little bit now into explaining what controlled and classified information is. I want to go a little deeper dive into that. The, you'll find the controlled and classified information is a unclassified information that requires additional protections. You guys can read the charts that are here. I've kind of buzzed over this. Um, 107 is the published number. I've been told that there's 129, and I've heard all the way up to 150-something different designators for protect our unclassified information that isn't releasable without FOIA and all that other wonderful stuff. I am not a classification officer, and I'm not someone who works the FOIA stuff. So as you'll see, there is a disclaimer at the bottom of every one of these slides about contact your security officer, classification specialist, and contracting officer to understand your company's controlled unclassified information. Um, this is probably the most difficult part of this, is identifying what you're attempting to protect, and you'll find it gets even harder. So I'd like to point out a term that if you're a defense contractor, you're going to be getting uh, made aware of very uh, soon, and you're going to find that it's called Covered Defense Information, or CDI. It falls into two things, controlled technical information, or excuse me, four things, my apologies, it's controlled technical information, critical information, export control information, then my favorite catch-all, and I'm going to read this real fast, don't be annoyed with this, any other information marked or otherwise identified in the contract that requires safeguarding and dissemination controls pursuant and consistent with laws, regulations, and government-wide policies. For example, privacy information or proprietary business information. To me, this becomes so broad that it's going to be difficult to identify what is controlled and classified information as a contractor. Our interpretation and my team's interpretation on this has been that almost everything in, that you do in, while involving yourself with the government could be considered CUI. And that catch-all puts us as contractors in a bind because we could have data that we feel is proprietary to, um, I'm just going to say SRC, and we come to find that that data the government may feel is government data, and if we have a, a compromise and that data gets out, for some reason they could go after us. And I'm like going, wow, that's a little weird. And I'm going to leave that to the lawyers to concern themselves with, but what a lot of people are doing and what I'm hearing now is, is that if they're not prepared for what does this really mean and they've already segregated their networks and gone through things because A, they've already been hacked, or B, they've already found pro other problems, um, that a lot of people are just saying, okay, everything on our network is considered CUI for now until we can say otherwise. Controlled technical information. This is, I'm gonna, this is here for you to see. This is a quote right out of the document. 
but anything to do, technical information to do with military or space applications. All of the, the uh, references here are, are spot on. You're more than welcome to go look them up, and I have links to some of these. But you'll notice that it doesn't include information that's lawfully uh, publicly available without restrictions. That puts many people in a bind because, for example, if you're producing, let's say, a fighter jet, um, the pic external pictures and there may be antennas on that fighter jet, and you may consider that pr pr proprietary information. However, the, you know, because it's public domain, it may not be considered controlled technical information, which to me is going to cause problems. Critical information. You're going to find that what was the OPSEC program is now considered a part of CUI and that we need to be aware of OPSEC anyways, but operational security is now a part of the CUI and we have to protect that. So this again gets vague when you start thinking about this. If I'm creating 50, uh, 50 end items to give to the government or to sell to the government, um, how do I have to protect the shipping information for that if I'm shipping them, let's say, from my factory to an overseas location and not going through some other logistics method? Export control information. Well, this one isn't hard for those of us that are involved in ITAR and all the other export controls, but just be aware that anything to do with this falls under CUI. And we are, I've already spent my five minutes talking about this piece, but we have contractor information. Uh, um, we're seeing contractor information um, out there that could possibly become, or become and be considered CUI. Again, a contractor information is any information system that belongs to or is operated for the contractor. Now, again, if you have questions on this and you're going to get into detail, um, the challenge space is, is that it's based upon your contract. As a security engineer, my best relationship I have going on nowadays is with our contracting officers, and I'm really working, and our team is working to assist our company with our um, understanding of what a contract says and what the government puts in the DD-254 or one of the other contract documents concerning um, information technologies and information security or cybersecurity or information assurance, whatever you want to call it today, and how we have to protect that data. I'd like to implore with you that if you're out there and you're, you're bidding on a contract, that you need to have a security engineer look at this nowadays beside your normal technical review team and a security engineer is someone who will speak IT technical and understand some of contracting but work closely with the contracting officer, officers and understand how to reduce requirements. So you guys doing the bid on the contract will bid the right time, cost, and effort because if you don't do that, you're going to all of a sudden find yourself you know, behind the eight ball and that will be a problem. <clears throat> Here is the challenge with CUI. Right now, it's up to the executive agency to furnish the information about their CUI. What we're seeing is, is DOD is being very proactive with this, with their DFAR. There's, there's publications out with the Federal Register. There's links in the back. They're out putting out these letters. They seem to be ahead of the curve on this. As a matter of fact, if you've been involved with any contracts lately, you'll find that the DFAR requirements are already being published today. And this is as this has been, you know, this was literally released just a couple months ago. The folks are already ahead of the curve and asking questions. All of these requirements flow down to the subcontractor. So you, as a prime contractor, let's say you're one of the big guys out there and you have a lot of subs, you have to concern yourself with how is my subcontractor protecting this information that they're supposed to be protecting for you. And the real question will come down to what if you have a specialist who all they ever do is have, let's say, a laptop that they keep their their data on for you. How do they implement all these requirements? We'll have to think about that one. So I'd like to go into talking about how do we implement 800, 171, or 171 requirements and what's important. This chart is a takeaway, guys. This is I'm, If you could see me, I'm stomping my foot right now. This is the one that you need to know. According to DOD, as of 30 December, we're supposed to have these requirements implemented by the December 31st, 2017. Um, these, again, are for your contractor information system. These aren't, um, I need to step back here in a minute. These are for your, as I called it, SRCinc.com networks that support all that, or if you're Lockheed, or if you're Boeing, or if you're Raytheon, or any of those. How are you going to protect those systems? 
according, the next most catch uh, uh, thing that caught my caught our eye is the change that came out on in December made it very clear that you're supposed to notify the DoD CIO of any non-implemented 171 security requirements within 30 days of contract award. Wait a minute, that's not as of 31 December. That is now. And we're being asked to do that now. My role and one of the things I'm putting together for my organization is a plan of actions and milestones or a POAM because we chose that as our format, listing the requirements and showing where we're at to provide to the DOD CIO to say, okay, we're compliant with policy type documents, our audit is good, our uh, two factor or multi factor authentication is poor, you know, giving them where we're at and what our work off plan is without too much detail in it because we have to have our wiggle room and our planning space. But that's how we're reporting that to the CIO and to prime contractors if requested. On the contrary, again, as I've already mentioned, please be aware mm. of your of any flow down requirements that could possibly be there. You as a prime contractor probably are already very aware of this that you need to ask your subs how they're doing this work and how they're going to get get to that point. What I'd like to um, jump back to for just a moment is with 800-171, this does not um, impact your contractual deliverables for a DOD contract. I'm only speaking for DOD right now. What I mean by that is, is that if you're building a device, gadget, software, whatever, for the government, and it's going to be deployed onto a federal information system, you're going to have to comply with federal information systems rules. So you may want to look at this as another guidance in the, in, in the infinite level of guidance that's out there today for creating protections to protect what you're building versus what you're building to sell to the government. Those will fall under your 853 requirements if that's uh, the risk manager framework is what they've guided you through, or if you're doing DOD, it'll be CNSSI 1253 requirements and however they've tailored them. Um, and you're going to have to build your systems to that requirement if that's what's been placed into your contract. However, how you protect what you're build building it, this can get a little confusing, is you have the 171 requirements in place for that. But the takeaway, work closely with your contracting officer. As a security engineer or as a program manager, if you're not shoulder to shoulder with your contracting officer and interpreting what's going on right now with all of the um, RFPs and all of the DD-254s that come with them, and, and all it says is protect the IT you know, or some very weak statement, it is in your best interest to question the government on that uh, those contracts out there and say, what is your specific requirements for protecting this device, gadget, service that I'm delivering for you? Um, we have observed um, very broad requirements from some organizations, um, 54 separate publications, um, internal publications that you're responsible for from an information security perspective. When I dared, when our team dared question this, the response was, this is what the rules are, you know, follow the rules. But when I asked them how I'm supposed to run the CIO's office for them, they said, well, that isn't in there. And then I ex we explained in the publication where it was listed, and they said, oh, no, that doesn't, you know, that isn't yours. And I asked them to change that to a reference, and they didn't do it, but that's a whole other story. Um, it didn't work out so well. Um, so be prepared for some discussions with federal organizations that you might not be accustomed to, or you're going to have to be very cautious on how you question this. I'd like to share with you um, a very basic roadmap to implementing a NIST IA program. The reason I'm sharing you uh, sharing this very high level is because each organization is at a different point in their IA life cycle, in their information assurance life cycle. You may be a very mature organization that's been doing computer security or CompuSec, I'm that old, and, and going through all the information assurance and how you're protecting your systems and you may have segregated your networks. The challenge, the, the, the difficulty you're going to find is, is to answer the 171 requirements is you're going to have to create some sort of a cybersecurity baseline. And what is meant by a cybersecurity baseline? From 
without putting my salesman hat on, but you know, kind of putting it on for just a moment, what that means is, is it's a good idea to bring in a, an external team or somebody, and it could be a part of your company that they do cyber assessments or, or security assessments and perform a technical and non-technical security assessment of your organization. That's soup to nuts, folks. That's everything. You want them to understand where your policies and governance are at, how your procedures work for creating new accounts, how you're going to handle your multi-factor authentication if you have it deployed from a non-technical perspective, what your policies and procedures are, and ensuring the folks are following that. That means when you hire somebody, they have a way to create that account. There's a reason for it. All the way through to architectural thoughts. And those architectural thoughts from a non-technical perspective is, is if I add a new node or I buy a new company and it becomes a part of our organizational group, how are we going to protect um, ourselves and others from that. You want to you want to be aware of the non-technical pieces of how your organization works and how you can communicate that to the government as a defense contractor. B, you need to look at the technical side. This is the fun part and this is the part everybody's comfortable with or most areas are comfortable with. That's where you go out and you throw your Nessus scanner at it and make sure you're compliant with STIGs if you use STIGs or some other hardening you know, Center for Internet Security type tools. Um, this is where you go out and you go and scan your networks with Nmap and you find all your open ports, protocols, and services. That's all the cool technical piece. But recall that when you, I know I'm talking about 171 here, but when you think about 853 controls, that 75% of those are non-technical controls, 25% are technical. Therefore, when you're doing your cybersecurity baseline, you're having a third party that could be internal, looking at what you have there without a vested, without that um, ownership of it. They're not the same people who wrote it, and they're providing you, the CIO, the contracting officer with whatever, the feedback so you can establish your roadmap of where you're going to go and your cybersecurity baseline, that point-in-time baseline. Two is, is developing a formal project plan for an enterprise IA program. Now, we're saying that's pretty, pretty hardcore. I mean, I'm only a company of 100 people. Why would I want to establish a plan? Because this plan is what you're going to put forward to the government when you have to answer your 171, where are you at? What's your status of health? So now you go and say, I've got a baseline established, and now I have my plan for going forward of what I'm going to do. That plan can be done in any way that you like to do planning. Okay, I'm not going to tell you you have to use Microsoft Project and you have to go through and have all your Gantt charts and all that other stuff, but some, some groups enjoy formally doing that. Others work pretty good from a whiteboard. Um, I prefer the whiteboard, but I have to do this, the Contra. Then you need to uh, obtain that buy-in. This is probably the hardest thing that you have to go through is to explain to your leadership, when you're, especially when you're a larger, mid-sized or larger organization, explain to them why this is in their best interest. Well, right now in your back pocket, you have three pieces of paper that, that well, excuse me, actually four pieces of paper that you're going to have references to. You have 800 that's telling you to protect controlled and classified information. You have two pieces of DFAR information from the Federal Register that give you implementation timelines and what the requirements are, and you have the DOD letter. Right now, you have a very, very solid foundation to go to your um, senior leadership and bring them the information they need to know to fund and to buy into doing information assurance or cybersecurity have to have that buy-in though and they need to start communicating to the employees also. They need to start talking downwards. While you're talking up like it seems like we're always doing as cybersecurity professionals, they're going to start communicating downwards with your guidance to help them and help the organization understand why you're implementing this 171 and what folks need to do. <clears throat> I would suggest that you implement a, the multi-phased IA program plan. That's based on, on, on uh, the second bullet. That plan, you aren't going to get everything done the first time. Um, we've been in this in this world for for a long time, all of us here. Some of us maybe not as long as others, but you'll know that even the most the most um, long-term companies that have been out there, maybe they've changed names a few times, but there's many companies out there who are developing very interesting projects for the government, and they have facilities where they're using unclassified stuff one time and they're hooking that to a classified network using um, using appropriate pro, uh, 
uh, procedures, protocols, et cetera, to do it, and then sanitizing afterwards. And they're using this stuff back and forth to test um, this hardware, software, whatever they're making, and they haven't bought into that they need to protect these in a different fashion. They, and they really need to look, we need to look at how we're using test equipment, um, test beds, where you have to look at how we're protecting the information systems on that, because a lot of times those racks of equipment, especially in a factory floor, get rolled into a closet and they're only broken out and dusted off when they're needed the next time. But they might be working on one system or another at the time. Um, there's other places where you're just going to have to protect. You have to start looking at your websites a little bit closer. It might be something more simple. And where you have information about your product that may be considered controlled and classified information loosely, and you may need to protect that in a different fashion. Um, but you need to implement this in a phased process. By the phasing, each step will guide you through what the most important things are. And by the way, your first steps I've already given you is to ensure you have a good incident response plan set up and that you're able to communicate to the government. Um, excuse me, number one is actually providing that, that 30 days of contract award is your plan forward. Two is, is your incident response plan and be prepared to communicate to the government if you have a compromise. And third of all, is ensuring your multi-factor authentication is being um, implemented in a fashion that's being communicated by the government. <clears throat> you want to, as you're going through this, you want to go through various self-assessment activities. The reason for doing this is, is this is just a typical feedback loop. You want to go through and verify and validate your deployment of your systems and see if there might be a need for a change to your plan. Because as we all know, New threats are, are coming up every day. They're, they're coming up and, and, and there's new groups out there with zero-day exploits. There's people out there breaking into systems and there's new ways of doing it. On the drive-in today, I just heard that um, that Wendy's may have been, Wendy's, the, the hamburger joint, may have been compromised. And I'm waiting for my seventh letter in the past 12 months that my credit card has been compromised um, based upon cybersecurity issues. They're investigating it today. I just heard that on the drive-in. So we know things are going on day in and day out where people are attempting to, to break into your networks or you have insiders trying to steal data from you, and you need to do those self-assessments to verify that you're on course and that you're, doing the verif and you're able to move forward with your plan and program. <clears throat> you also want to validate your cybersecurity posture at each significant milestone. What I mean by that is, is how our organization looks at it and how we guide a lot of organizations is, is a lot of this, even though this one needs to be accelerated just a little bit, we look at it as a year-long program. So you go in and you do your cybersecurity baseline. You get it established. You know what type of work you have to do to bring yourself up to a certain point that you have your goal set for. When you reach that milestone, have management hold that IT team responsible for where they're supposed to be. That's a part of their role. And sometimes I see that fall down because a lot of times when, with the exception of the technical managers, the, the senior leaders out there kind of get that eye roll of what in the world. But when they see you're doing a program plan and they get that grasp of what you're doing, they come in and hold your team accountable and responsible for what you're doing. And then they give you a green light to go ahead and press on to the next phase with whatever course corrections you've made. That's important because, one, it gains that buy-in by the executive leadership teams Two is it gives your groups that are out there working on these programs are working so hard on them that that recognition, while it might not be the recognition they're looking for, it makes them all of a sudden feel, hey, the boss actually likes what I'm doing. This is good. And they're showing that we're protecting government information and our proprietary information in, in very strong ways. Let's jump to the next slide here. How am I looking for time? We're looking good today. So based upon references and links, each of these are documents you need to be aware of. We have them available to us. Um, those links are all valid. I just checked them yesterday, as a matter of fact. Um, you need to go out, and if you haven't pulled these yet, these documents, you need to become familiar with them. Now, I'm not telling you guys how to do your jobs, but it seems to me that if we want to maintain working for the government and our companies want to maintain that, we have to embrace this, in my perspective, in the ways that have been guided. Our, our guidance has been from the DOD to implement these controls by December 2017, or excuse me, these requirements by December 2017, and some of these are not easy. There's communications in there about segmenting your network. Your network today may be flat. It may be wide open. It's just being controlled, let's say, by Active Directory controls, and you, and, and you have your CUI 
spread throughout your entire organization. You don't even know where it is. You're going to have to figure out and do some sort of data reconnaissance to figure out where it is. You're going to have to look at your system as a whole from an enterprise perspective of how do I want to protect this? If I have an area that doesn't require multi-factor authentication, how can I segment that out possibly? Or how can I control it to where only my privileged users have to have, privileged users or system administrators, if you will, um, have to have this uh, multi-factor authentication in place so only their accesses are controlled um, more tightly than, let's say, um, a receptionist, for example. Um, there's a lot of things you need to look at, and these, got, these references and guidance will, uh, will put you in that direction. Well, I got to the end. I think there's probably going to be some time for questions here. Um, I can share a few stories, but let's go ahead and do some questions first, if you don't mind, Steve, and then we'll uh, see if we – that might just guide us down a path of getting into some more information here. Sure thing, Wade. That uh, yeah. that sounds like a good uh, good approach. And we do have a number of uh, questions from our attendees. And uh, the first one up was, um, why are we seeing uh, contracts uh, with the DFARS clause, but uh, they don't include any distribution statements? Distribution statements. Wow. I'm glad I'm not a contracting officer. Um, what I what okay, I'm gonna be perfectly clear here, folks. I'm a security engineer. I don't have my contracting officer sitting with me today. I do have a post a, a program manager, so we could we could possibly get that question, but I from a distribution statement, I, I don't really know how to respond to that question, but what I'm gonna do is take a swing for the fence anyways. What I'm seeing is is that these clauses are being added to the contracts now because they've been directed to because of the DFAR change. What I'm finding is that there has been no extra guidance provided yet, other than the publications, on how to implement and what to do for these. Now, can we maybe ask whoever asked that question, Steve, a little bit more about what they mean by the distribution statement so I can maybe go down the right path? Uh, sure. If, uh, if the uh, individual that uh, uh, posed that question uh, has, you know, can try to clarify, uh, uh, give a little bit more specific info for for way to try to uh try to answer the question but uh that's where we'll uh we'll let's see if see if something comes in uh, let's see okay uh the distribution statement is what uh, actually designates the CUI ah i can see i see where you're popping up there thank you mr garcia hey um on that to be specific i i asked those questions myself thank you for letting me know um I didn't get into that detail. CUI is controlled actually by the National Archives, if you believe it. Um, and the National Archives has not come out with any sort of classification markings for that that I'm aware of as of yet. Um, the reference that I provided for CUI is an excellent reference to go out and look and see what's going on. The thing is, is it's going to be come down to the actual organization that you're, you're supporting or working for is going to tell you how to document that. And as of today, the two prime organizations I work with, I have not seen um, clear guidance on that yet. They're very good on the classified side. On this side, they're not. So I wish I could answer your question better, but that's, that's as much information as I have today. Okay. Thanks, Wade. Uh, now the uh, the next the next one um, asks: uh, Do you do you see some of these callouts for the uh, COI being included within a, a DD uh, two fifty four for a contract? I would I would hope they are going to be put clearly in the DD two fifty four or in another portion of the documents. Um, it's my experience again with a couple of the groups that I work with that that. I know that one of them is moving pretty quickly to put that in there. By the way, that's an IC organization. On the DOD side, what I've heard from our contracting officers, and they just haven't gotten it to me yet, is they're actually listing all the requirements. So all 170-something, if I recall correctly, requirements that are listed there are being put in there line by line. So I think it's going to be a my, – my belief is it's going to be a variable based upon the executive organization that's putting this information down to you or the, or the, con, the, the offerer. Um, excuse me, the government organization is going to put that down to you, and that's how they're going to do it. However, as of now, I've, I've advised all the program managers and all of our contracting officers within SRC to be prepared to ask questions specifically, especially on new contracts, on specificity of requirements. Um, our team spends a lot of time writing software, for example, and 
you're going to find where people are asking, how do you protect that software? This is in contracts in general, to be perfectly honest. And uh, you need to go back and ask them, are you looking for some sort of a software assurance program? What do we have to have as a company? Um, are we looking for some sort of qualifications? And the government's got to be very specific because right now, 171 covers how you protect that data on your corporate system versus on your deliverables. So it's gonna, it, the answer is, unfortunately, is it depends on the organization that's providing with that contract. Okay. And, and the DD-54 is definitely the appropriate place for it, but I'm not the contracting guy to, to put that out there. Okay. Um. I'd say I know during during your talk you you know you talked about a say a prime contractor with subcontractors and you know the requirements uh, rolling down to the uh, to the subs. Uh, so we have a question about um, does that also extend down if you have consultants? Does that does that extend to your consultants as well? That's that's an excellent question. That is that to me that is one of the more difficult questions. As a matter of fact, while it sounds very simple. We dip, the answer is yes. Now here's here's the, the 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 interesting part of this. It depends on what information that consultant is um, is securing or or managing. What data set? So um, the the way I look at it is is I, I'm I'm working as a consultant for an organization. I'm a subject matter expert on some topic, and I now have a folder full of uh, government information on my laptop. Now that laptop has to be protected. Um, it's going to be on the prime's, pardon me. It's going to be on the prime shoulders to ensure that that consultant is protecting that data appropriately. I'm also putting on my security hat right now, and putting on that one that has the big star on the front of it. Yes, of course you have to protect that data. However, how you do it is risk based, and you have to take that into account. Am I going to expect that individual on their per, on their laptop? to do full up auditing and everything and, and, and compromise detection and all that. I don't know how they're gonna do that really. And this is a piece where you as an organization will have to look at the risk and how you want to protect that data. You may choose to use, let's say, an external drive. You may, you know, where they're not always on that computer, or you may choose that data at rest, excuse me, I know all the all the tweaks in there that can get in that discussion. Um, so but for data at rest you may say, hey, I want you to keep it on an encrypted uh, drive, external drive that you disconnect from your computer when you're not using it. Or you may find some other way of protecting the data where they, let's say, VPN into your system um, and you have a, uh, a relationship with them where they VPN and will do the work on your system um, or, or on a, on a cloud-based solution if that's what you're using. I believe that answers the question. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, so during, during your uh, presentation, uh, you talked about a... Um, uh, a format for reporting uh, the information to the DoD uh, CIO. Uh, folks, folks are wondering whether that uh, format you mentioned is available uh, to uh, to the audience. As of a week ago, um, I have not been informed by the DoD, nor has my team been informed specifically on how to report this information. That is why we've made the decision to use the the typical a typical POANM type format on a spreadsheet where we list out each of the controls and that's how we are excuse me the requirements and that's the decision that we made as an organization. Um, we are anticipating that to change. We are actually anticipating it because we're pondering how the government's going to handle this quantity of there could be up over ten thousand defense contractors out there and how are they prepared to receive all this information from these contractors or these, you know, after post uh, contract award, how are they going to expect to receive this information, manage it and store it? So in my opinion, you're going to possibly see a spreadsheet at first and then I have a feeling they're going to come up with some database that they're going to expect us to input it into um, or some other data entry format that they're going to want so they can just dump it into a system. I don't have a clear answer on that, but we made the decision to go with a, a typical POAM type format. Um, we quite often use different flavors. Um, I found the FedRAMP one to be useful if that's what you choose to use. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, okay, so you, you noted the timeline. You noted the timeline for um, you know re responding. You know, responding to this requirement. But uh, we, we one of the attendees asks, uh, how does this affect? Current contracts, so I, I'm, I'm 
taking that to mean uh, you know an existing contract that's already in place is there is there any impact uh, that will uh, you know will have any effect on a current contract that you're uh, executing at this this very moment? Certainly, excellent question. Um, that was one of my first questions I asked, and, and I think that's a very wise question to ask. Um, the answer is, whoops. The answer is that um, right now, it affects it, it impacts them. Now, it, has there been anything in writing for that? Well, this is based upon our experience when this is initially published. We have. Uh, SRC, with you know, in full disclosure, has a has a subcontract with an, uh, one of the large contract uh, uh, large organizations out there, where subcontractor working for them, and they have already sent within days of the original document coming out uh, back in October, they sent down the questionnaire to us of how we're implementing these controls. That was for a current contract. Um, is it written anywhere that it applies that way? No, we haven't found it. But our contracting officers and my lead um, contracting officer has said that it impacts them directly. And I said, thank you, stood tall and, and pressed on, right? Um, that's a proper question to ask your government contracting officer. And I would address that. Um, I, I don't know if the person is a contracting officer who asked the question, but go to your contracting officer who in turn will go to the government and ask that specific question of them. Um, but be prepared for the answer that you're not going to want to hear, which is, yes, of course it does make it so. Okay. okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for fielding that one. Yeah. Um, okay. So one of our one of our attendees uh, is wondering if there is some type of a uh, contractor self inspection or audit tool that uh, may already have been developed and released by DSS. Uh, are you aware of any anything like that? Nope. The answer to your question, and I'm actually sorry, I'm going to tell a story on this one, is no. Um, as a longtime government security officer. Um, my expectation would be that the government would have been very directive in nature on how they want this data protected. They would have told us specifically what they wanted and how they're going to assess it. Well, as of right now, that is not the path they're going down. Um, this is also based upon a week and a half of work with the defense and uh, the DIB, um, the um, defense industrial base, and providing some feedback to the CIO. There's probably going to be a follow-on question to this of. Um, of um, additional requirements um, that would be come that would be derived from breaking down each of these requirements. I'm going to break this into two pieces. <laughs> Pardon me. Number one is um, the checklist. The government has not provided any other than I believe it's a couple of areas, and number one of those is an encryption. They are fairly specific on how they expect data in motion and data in rest to be encrypted um, to include saying that you'll use um, the NIST um, encryption standards, saying that how, how they expect you to establish that. And some of the biggest pushback we had while we were in DIB was on that specific topic. And because it was so specific in nature, it said you will employ um, FIPS 142, 140-2 compliant software algorithms along with how you manage those keys. And they got into all the detail of how that's going on. But this document is supposed to be risk-based and how we protect that data. So it was very interesting to hear the conversation from my perspective of how one side, the DOD CIO, was being rather firm that you will comply when the whole time before that he's been saying you don't have to comply. So he did get called out for that, by the way. And we had to try to figure out how we're going to do this. So what I'm... What I don't see is a checklist today. What I see is they're going to look at these requirements. They're going to have to figure this out. Your self-assessment is going to be based upon what your security officers know because right now the government's going to have to trust what you're sending them, but they're not going to be prepared to verify. With that all being said, I was just informed this morning that one of my colleagues um, out in the Midwest had heard that the government is possibly do not take this for fact, establishing um, an organization to do these assessments, and it really sent me for a loop because they haven't put out what we have to comply with other than the high-level requirements, which makes it very difficult, especially as a security engineer, and I have to break these requirements down to, to edible chunks, is to say to our folks, oh, by the way, you must comply with STIG. 
But it doesn't say that in the book. Someone's going to argue. I'm going to say, absolutely, you're correct. But, but because they're coming out to do this checklist. So to answer the question in such a long, roundabout manner, no, there is no checklist. As of right now, they're not supposed to be doing that. However, I've been around the government for a long time. I'm kind of old, and I've been around since I was 18 years old in the Air Force. And the government doesn't like to do work in the way they're doing with this. They, they want to be able to send out um, a contractor to assess that organization or a government person to assess that organization the way they do with DCAA or, or DSS right now, and they're going to want to have that checklist. I think we're going to have more fights, or excuse me, fights are too strong. We're going to have debates and discussions over this for the next year or two while they figure out what they're going to do. And the DOD CIO, at least from my experience, is aware of this and prepared to start um, um, I just lost the word. To start um, refereeing, if you will, these type of conversations. They're prepared for that. Long roundabout answer for, for no. There isn't anything that's that. But there's there's a reason for that story is because it was well discussed, and that's what I wanted to sell to you, or let you guys know. This was highly discussed with contractors from our smaller, from much smaller than even SRC, which is a thousand people, all the way up to some of the big four that are out there. So you know, these, this has been pushed back on the government already. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it is interesting because uh, you know when it, when it's kind of fuzzy and you know there's flexibility, it it does kind of make it hard to go in and you know you don't have that standard standard checklist that you can run through and make sure everybody is uh, adhering to the uh, you know to the rules and regulations uh so when everybody kind of decides on their own that that, that makes it a much more difficult uh task for sure so oh, i i would not i'll be very blunt i would not want to be an assessor of this i would not be want to be on the other side of this fence um but I don't want to go down that for too long. This is this is going to be very difficult for all parties involved. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, so let's see. We've got a question. Does uh, does 171 provide um, uh, any reference marking standards or guidelines? For example, headers, uh, portion marks, control vocabulary for CUI types. Uh, is that any kind of that information in in uh, 171? No, um, 171 is specifically focused on the information technology that's out there and how you protect the data while there. That would come out from um, your executive organization or uh, NARA or the National Archives at some future time. Um, they have not yet, um, but I expect that to be pushed down to the lower levels. While I say DOD is being pro very proactive, I'm not a classification officer. I haven't seen anything as of this time. Okay. Um See, there was a question about the implementation deadlines. I thought I saw 31 December 2017, but is that is that? Um, I'll let you confirm or. Sure, no problem. I jump back real quick to the the chart with references and links. The second Federal Register document there. The the I highly recommend you guys grab this. Um, on the first page of this, in the upper right hand corner, um, it says, and I quote. Uh, this is what it says. The clause is also amended to require contractors to notify the DOD Chief Information Officer, CIO, of any NIST 800-171 security requirements that are not implemented at the time of contract award within 30 days of contract award. So that's where the documentation piece comes in. It says you have to let them know about that. However, a part of this, because of the pushback by contractors, on the second page of this piece of the Federal Register, it states, this rule allows contractors until December 31st, 2017, to implement the security requirements specified in the, paraphrased, 171. Um, so that's where the dates come from. So okay. December 31st, 2017, as of, as of the 30th of December of last year, is our cutoff date to get the stuff implemented, or at least our version of it. And however, we have to explain to the DOD CIO what our current security footprint is um, um, within 30 days of a contract award. Unfortunately, they haven't provided formats for that. They haven't provided specifically who to report that to, if I recall correctly. Um, even though one of the documents does have something sort of in it, I think it's gonna probably be done through the defense industrial base at first, but you'll have the reporting that way. But, but this is what you're looking at. They've got dates, but we don't have good solid instructions on how to report. Highly recommend you download the document. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, let's see. Some someone is asking in one does 171 provide or reference um, machine readable CUI tags, uh, for example, to support the uh, automated data loss prevention. The answer still is no. 171 um, is a typical standards document produced by NIST, so they don't provide those tags. They do provide good definitions and things um, for uh, their, by the way, their CNSSI 4009 definitions, but um, they provide the government definitions for different roles, requirements, what you're doing, et cetera, but not to the level of CUI. Again, that'll fall back on your executive organization or wherever the designee is. Okay. Um, somebody, uh, so somebody would like your thoughts, Wade, on uh, the requirements to use FIPS validated crypto for confidentiality, and uh, specifically to uh, to limit its scope. Uh, it's a huge burden for a lot of development type networks that may be on various Linux environments. Uh, require outdated versions of various crypto libraries. Uh, you have any? Uh, you got to personal take on that one? Okay, guys, getting ready to go down the technical path, so get on, get ready for the ride. Um, crypto, the discussion for that literally took up a three, uh, we had a two and a half hour time block that took up probably two hours and 25 minutes of that time block. The biggest pushback specifically, and now let's recall on this, we're talking about, they're primarily focusing on, um, this focuses on the, the corporate network, so the LockheedMartin.com or the you know SRC.com or whatever those are, right? They're concerned with those networks. The development network is unique, and I'll get to that in just – well, I'll go ahead and say it now. The, the, the unique part about the development network is, is you may not even have to have that encryption there if it's separate from your corporate network because that might be sponsored by the federal government versus being a part of your corporate entity. Those that work in this day in and day out kind of know where I'm heading here is, is that that may be completely separate, not falling under the 171 rules. It'll fall under as a federal information system because it's accredited um, or approved under that federal information system. So there's going to be some separated rules here. However, concerning encryption, let's go to that path real quick. The fifth validated crypto was discussed because we know what type of burden that lays onto a Windows uh, a Windows environment, I know I'll go down to Linux here in just a minute, but the Windows environment in Active Directory to implement all the controls that are required causes you to be running a, a modern versions, uh, very modern versions of uh, Microsoft Server. You have to set it up and have to run the whole network using that encryption set, and it bogs down the network. Well, excuse me, that's unfair to say. I don't like saying bogs. It, it, it can impact the performance of your network. Sysadmins also know it's a pain to take care of at times. Two is on your Linux side. That's a great question. Um, they don't want you using Blowfish, but the point is, is we're going to go out and they're looking for you to use one of the FIP. Well, excuse me, Blowfish is a FIPS, but you're going to want to go out and use your FIPS 140-2 implementation. And on a dev network, that may not work. You may want to roll your crypto in your design. Let me say this correctly. You may want to look at your crypto later in your design points, making sure you have the right hooks in your system development, but not have it turned on till later in the system. I'm looking at my PM right now, and I'm getting that look of where it's a phase point of where you're doing your cryptography and ensuring your communication and your data at rest works, just ensure it's in your planning. Now, I'm reading the question, Steve. I'm cheating on this one a little bit. Um, I recognize that it is a burden, and this is understood by the government, and this is where it's risk-based. You as program managers or as developers will need to communicate to security officers, we appreciate these rules. However, when we're back in the lab, we're not connected to the Internet. We're, our, our risk is so low or could be so low that you communicate it appropriately, and that's why you need to, to use those, um, those the very positive communications to get that to work well for you. Implementing crypto is going to be probably, and I still consider it the hardest thing that because they were so specific when I was involved with the DIB conversations, and they didn't like it when I told them that other government organizations weren't even following those rules, um, that it's going to be questionable the entire time we're doing it. And I think you might see some relief on some of that. What they're trying to do, though, is really data at rest. Um, think about your your people who break into networks, your APT or some other organization that possibly breaks into networks, and how you're going to protect your data. And what you don't want to have happen is, is, an, is a... Um, unauthenticated user getting into a data store where they can all of a sudden get a treasure trove because they, they possibly raise their permission set um, to allow them to get into that, that, that data store and are able to steal all that information. However, 
we all know that a lot of times they're operating as a authenticated user and that's difficult because the encryption will not protect the data set anyways and that was a part of the conversation also so many levels of this was have been discussed but I think it makes them feel good to feel that you put the armor around that data or encrypted it if you will and it makes you at least show some sort of a, a preventative status to do the best you can I believe I touched the questions um, but the, the real question is, is you're doing work for the federal government. The federal government requires FIPS validated encryption. Sorry, that's what you're supposed to do. Okay. Uh, now, I think this next one, I think you've, you, you've touched on it already, but this may be a slightly different twist. Uh, so there's a question about um, who, you know, who, who will actually be enforcing the 171 for each contractor and are there actually enough qualified people to review all the requirements in a timely manner? I, I have kind of touched on that, but the answer to your question right now is um, is I can probably let you know better after February. Our organization is going through a DCAA audit come February, and they are going to be reviewing the DFAR, these requirements on us. We are hoping that our planning and our communications, I know hope isn't a plan, but we are, we are, our goal is that our POAM and our understanding of the requirements will satisfy this for now and without showing that we have an implementation plan moving forward to make our, our organization compliant with 171. I hate to use the word compliant, but to embrace 171 and that we're doing the right thing. Um, we have shortfalls just like every other organization does. So we're hoping that works out. Now, a year from now, I would be more than happy, I think it would be interesting to look at this and say, how has the government modified this to allow it to fit into more of their normal standard working methodologies? But right now, they don't have enough people. And I don't even think they know what they're going to do with this yet. I think it's going to be like a, we're going to trust the contractors until we have something else happen. You also have to look at it from another perspective, and I'll make this real quick because I see the time. The, what I'd like you to think about is, is that it's up to you to protect your data. It's up to you to protect the government's data. And what this is all about is liability. And if you lose government data, the government could theoretically cut your contract and go after you for losing that data. And that's what this is all about, is covering everybody's um, six, for those fighter pilots out there. And uh, you want to make sure that you're covering yourself and your company. Do a good, solid job of protecting this data. 171 is a guideline, is a is a standard. It's a NIST standard, so follow it. Look at it, define it for yourself, and communicate back to the DoD how you're doing your work. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, so uh, the D, uh, DoD has issued uh, DFARS on the 171 requirements, and one of our attendees uh, is wondering if there are any updates from other government agencies, like uh, GSA, for example. I apologize, I haven't seen any yet. Um, but I also haven't been digging for that because we're, defense, we're primarily focused on defense contracting and the intelligence community, and that's where my area of expertise, is, or, or I don't want to call it expertise, my area of knowledge is. So um, I haven't seen anything, but I also spend a lot of time over on the FedRAMP side of the house, and I haven't seen anything there yet either. Okay, okay, thanks. That is GSA-ish. Yeah. Um, so let's see, an individual is wondering what the uh, minimum requirement is for actually reporting a, uh, a cyber incident. Um, uh, they use the term uh, potential in the DFAR clause is the uh, phishing attack or spam attack or, you know, when malware actually gets in installed inside a computer. Is there, so do you have any uh, better feeling or uh, description on the uh, cyber incident uh, term terminology? I, I have not seen anything as of yet. Um, personally, I haven't seen anything, and that was another point of discussion during incident response um, on the, the DIB when we were involved with the DIB. And um, that's a great question. I see also a follow-on on the reporting. Yes, you are correct. I, I'm looking it up real quick, but there is specific reporting, and I believe it is DC3 um, through the uh, uh, DOD CIO who you have to report to for DOD. Um, but I haven't seen anything on the level of detail that they're expecting it, but I, if I recall correctly, the words are, comprom are a suspected compromise of information. I'd have to go back and do my research, I have to dig, I could look it up, but I don't want to hear you guys flip through paper and we're running a little late. But I just wanted to say that they're, they're going to have to define that. 
um, clearly. And if it's just a spam thing, it's one thing. But I think it has to do with suspected compromise or actual compromise, I think, are the words. Or of the data, of the DOD data. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. We are we are already past our a lot of time. Uh, how, how, do you have time for... Uh, I have more than... Yes, sir. I'm more than happy to stay. Um, I just I wanted to be um, open-minded to the rest of our folks out there. I don't sure. know how to stay. Okay. Uh, so uh, do you think if uh, as a pr prime start reporting, uh, the level of uh, compliance uh, could be used as a uh, metric in future awards? I I'm sorry. I missed the question. Please repeat. Let's see. As uh, as a prime start uh, reporting, uh, I guess maybe does the uh, you know the information that they feed back um, that you know a level of compliance uh, could then be used um, as some kind of a metric for for future awards. I guess you know kind of some iterative process where it gets folded back in and maybe re refined as to the uh, you know the uh, re requirements that are imposed upon each each contract. Um. Wow. Uh, yeah. I'm going to cop out. I'm not a contracting officer. Um, I, I would love to answer that question. I'd love to get into a long discussion over that question. I believe that the government's going to have to review these requirements more closely. Um, but what I'm seeing, and they're going to have to work, this is going to be an iterative process of what's taking place. I believe what I heard in that question was, is it going to be like a scoring system? I'm looking at my colleague right now to, with her head nod on that. And I am deeply concerned, personal concern, this is not this is not reflective on my organization. I'm concerned that they could use this as a, as a scorecard, if you will, for that organization. And if they're not being proactive, it may be derogatory when you bid on a contract. But please, again, this is not... This is my personal opinion. Um, I prefer that the government wouldn't do that, but you know it makes sense. If you have an organization that's out there and they can't seem to protect your data, why in the heck would you hire them? Just my opinion. Um, but did that answer the question, or did that get to the point of the question? Yes, it did. <laughs> oh, yay! <laughs> I also note that I know that right now, um, our organization, there was a question asked earlier uh, concerning, is it, uh, I use the word retroactive, but is it to current contracts? Our organization today has 20 contracts out there that are impacted by this DFAR clause. And, and again, we're not that big, but we have over 20 contracts that have been, that the DFAR clause has been mentioned as of today. Uh, so uh, were those just recent awards since this was was uh, that letter was announced back in in October, or or were, had they been awarded uh, prior to that time too, or you know some of them awarded prior to that, uh, you know. My understanding these were awarded prior to that, and these are amendments. Right. You, like if they amend a contract, Got, they're putting it in there. Gotcha, gotcha. Thanks, thanks. Um, Okay, I, th I think uh, we're probably going to wrap up. I, I know we've got a question about, uh, well, there's a question about can the presenter provide a draft of the format, specifically the headers used for the DOD CIO report, um, informing DOD of noncompliance. Is, uh, is that the POAM that you've uh, mentioned a couple times? Is that Sure, I'd be happy to do that. I have a, I have a blank copy and my working copy. Y'all aren't going to get my working copy. That gives up all of our secrets, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> what I'll give is the header that I keep as my as a skeleton, and again, it's up to you to modify it. This is um, it's a hack of the uh, FedRAMP version of the of a POAM, um, and a couple other organizations that we use. But we'll be more than happy to provide you with that. I can I can get that out in no time at all, or to you, Steve, so you can post it. Okay, okay, that would be great. That would be great. Uh, so so in the uh, another individual kind of that is that, but this is uh, uh, asking about. Um, when will we talk about this topic again and possibility of you know of, uh, monthly uh, updates uh, so uh, in the in this webinar series uh, we we cover a broad range of topics uh, is it so you know this this was our topic for for this particular month um, 
you know, we probably won't be addressing it in this, uh, you know, webinar f format. But uh, we we may we do have a, a website uh, where we have uh, communities of practice, communities of interest, where where folks can uh, you know g get on and um, you know exchange information uh, on our website. You know, you can you can pass info info back and forth and share knowledge that you've uh you know you've you've picked up and uh, you know try and keep ev everybody abreast so uh if that's something of interest we we do have the uh, you know at, at csiac.org uh and and um you can send in uh email at info at csiac.org and and you know we can try and help uh you know organize and set up a group like that if that's if that's something of interest so i uh, just wanted to you know point that out and yeah, you know, I want to thank everybody for attending, and uh, uh, Mr. Castor for uh, giving the presentation. It's uh, you know, it's a, I think it's a topic that uh, you know, for all the folks contractors out there, it's uh, you know may have a sig significant impact. And appreciate Wade you taking the time to help clarify the situation and let us know where where things stand. And uh, we know it, it still sounds like things are in a state of flux, but it's uh, you know good good to know where we are right at this point in time and. We will keep abreast as uh, as things develop here down the road. Thank you very much, Steve, and thanks to everybody who is here with us. I do appreciate it taking the time. This is a difficult topic, but we all need to work forward with it. Um, Steve, one thing I was going to ask is, is that we had uh, over there on the chat side. I saw it there, and it caught my interest once. That's why I completely hesitated. If there's a possibility, can we copy it and paste that into a document so I can follow up with a few of the folks there or work with you on uh, following up? Because there's a couple of questions that I got um, are a couple statements um, this, which followed on that whole CIO presentation or, you know, uh, discussions about this. So I, I think you got something here to gain some traction for the for the website and such. So thank you very much for sponsoring this. We appreciate it. We appreciate it. Okay. Well, thanks again and uh, appreciate everybody for, for, uh, for attending and uh, hope you all have a great day out there. Thank you very much. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.